Hi everyone, I'm back with my top 10 highlights from Mounts chapter 16 and 17. First of all, chapter 16, that talks about verbs, voices, and tenses. My first tip for you is about the active voice. Mounts talks about it in his textbook in section 16.2 and 16.3. Active voice can be simple, in which case the subject performs the action. It can be causative, in which case the subject causes the action to be performed. Or it can be stative, where the subject simply exists in a state or a statement simply is true. Those are my words, not months. Here's my tip number two for you. It concerns the passive voice. Mounts talks about this in his textbook in chapter 16 and sections 5 and 6. The passive voice is simple if the subject is the recipient of the action or receives the action of the verb. Or the passive form can be used in such a way that it becomes identical in meaning and translation to an active voice. This has traditionally been called a deponent, a passive deponent. And what was meant by that word deponent was, this is a verb that lacks any active voice forms. There is, however, in fact today, a debate among Greek New Testament scholars about whether verbs should be called deponent at all. Many today believe these verbs simply follow different patterns than other verbs that have two different active and passive spellings. So, you must interpret a passive voice when it's not a simple passive individually in terms of meaning in context and understand that many times it can be passive in form or in its analysis in your biblical software. It will indicate to you that it's passive voice but you'll see in English it's translated with an active meaning. That means that we are not aware of any active voice forms for this particular verb. Here's my tip number three for you. It concerns the middle voice. Mounts talks about this in chapter 16 in sections 7 through 12. The easiest way to understand this foreign concept to us as English speakers, middle voice. The easiest way to understand it, I think, is to say that in the middle voice, the subject is both active and passive. Both the actor the per person performing the action, and the recipient, the person receiving the action of the verb in some way. Both things at once. With a direct middle, there is a direct connection. The subject performs the action and receives the impact of the action herself or himself. In English, we use a reflexive pronoun to indicate that, himself or herself. With an indirect middle, the action is performed by the subject in a way that connects back to the subject's purpose or interest in performing or initiating the action. I talked about deponency to you just a moment ago and what it means already, so I won't go over that again. And since you don't need to recognize forms, what Mount says in chapter 16 and section 12 is not something you need to know. Here's my fourth tip for you, my final tip from chapter 16. It concerns transitive and intransitive verbs. And the concept here is very simple. In this, these two sections in 16, 13, and 14, Mounts reminds you that verbs either use direct objects and the action of the verb passes or transits from the subject to the object through the verbal action. That's transitive. Or the opposite. The action does not pass from subject to object, in which case it's intransitive. That's all for chapter 16. 
Now, in a moment, I'll go on to chapter 17. Chapter 17 is all about verbs and tenses. First of all, some words of introduction from me. Mounts' opening statement in chapter 17 is important. It says, and I'm going to quote it now, While a tense may have a general meaning, you'll discover that it has many other nuances and variations in terms of its meaning. And I would add these nuances and variations can alter the general meaning in ways that are sometimes pretty substantial. In chapter 17 and sections 1 and 2, Mounts tries to say this to you as well. So here's my first tip for chapter 17. It's about the present tense. Mounts talks about the present tense in chapter 17 in sections 3 through 9. He says the present tense describes continuous action that can be instantaneous or take a while. And so it's called instantaneous or progressive. Both these presents happen across a relatively narrow band or span of time, so they're called narrow band. Present tense can also happen across a relatively broad band of time in which case it's repeated action, or customary action, or habitual action, or even timeless action, which means continuously or always true. Present tense always has that continuing sense. It can even be used in a historical or dramatic way to write history, I would say, as if it's happening right now in front of you, as if you're watching uh, a scene from a TV news show, and the reporter starts off by saying, this is happening now, right now, and that clip comes across in the six o'clock news. After it's happened, but as if it's happening right in front of you. Since that's historical, and taking some time, it's not instantaneous, so it's broadband too. Next month goes on in chapter 17 and sections 10 through 12 to talk about the future tense. The future tense is always future from the perspective of the speaker or the author. It can be predictive future, predicting an action that will take place in the future. Or it can be imperatival future, directing or commanding that an action will take place, shall take place in the future. My next tip for you comes in relation to what Mounts has to say about the imperfect tense in chapter 17 and sections 13 and 14. The imperfect portrays past action by saying it was ongoing past action of some kind. That action can be progressive or durative, two terms that mean the same thing. Or it can describe past action that is emphasizing the beginning of the past action that continues on for a while, in which case it's called ingressive or inceptive. My next tip for you concerns the Eris tense, chapter 17, sections 18 through 22. The Eris tense describes action in an undefined way, without putting boundaries around it without talking about its continuation. It just happened. It tells you the action happened. So the aorist tense can be constative, portraying an action short or long as a whole thing, seeing it as a whole and saying this happened. It can be ingressive, stressing the action happened, but laying emphasis on the beginning of the action that happened. It can be consummative, laying emphasis on the fact the action happened and was completed. It was consummated. Or it can be nomic, meaning the action happened, but it will happen again and again and again because it is nomic. It is the kind of action that happens again and again and again. That gets very close to the Perfect tense, which is what Maltz talks about last in chapter 17. 
but the perfect tense is slightly different than a nomic aorist. Take a look at chapter 17 and sections 23, 24, and 25. They talk about the perfect tense. The perfect tense portrays action that was completed, but has continuing effects or continuing results in present time, the present time of the writer. And many times, those present results continue to impact the time beyond the writer. They continue to impact us. The perfect tense can be consummative or extensive. Those two words mean the same thing. And what they mean is, this is a perfect tense that lays emphasis on the fact that the action happened in the past, rather than laying emphasis on the present results or impacts. Or you can turn it around. The perfect tense can be intensive, laying emphasis on the present results rather than the past act. All these voice and tense categories are listed for you on your Greek for the Rest of Us laminated study sheet. They're there so you can bring them back to your memory. They're on the inside left page when you open the laminated study sheet. And you'll be able to find, without having to remember what chapter of months that was in, you'll be able to find the place where a commentator talks about a consummative perfect tense or a constative errors tense. Remember, you can also use your pocket dictionary to look up grammatical terms like that when you're reading a commentary too. I hope these tips are helpful for you as you think about what you want to learn from chapter 16 and 17. Thanks for hanging in there and uh, think about all you've learned from the time that you began with the chapter on the alphabet until now. You've learned a lot of Greek. There's more to go. And I hope it's making the New Testament more meaningful for you.